Excuse me, I'm delighted to be here today. I want to thank the Society for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to come back to the APS, which funded some of my early work when I was working on a Native American alcohol use. And I have to say, it's really nice for me to be back in my hometown. I'm a graduate of the Germantown Friends School, if anybody... Uh, there you go, yeah, there you go, all right. Anyway, so it's really great to be back in Philadelphia and to speak to you uh, today. So, okay, with that, and I'm gonna show you a lot of pictures. Um, so if you actually can dim the lights a little more if, if you want, um, that's up to you guys, okay. When scholars of the early modern Atlantic world think about landscape, we tend to conceptualize a place in the midst of change. This is not surprising. Ever since the late environmental historian Alfred Crosby coined the term the Columbian Exchange in 1972, we've been very aware that the arrival of Europeans in the Western Hemisphere initiated unprecedented changes, especially the catastrophic decline in the population of indigenous peoples. As Crosby explained, Europeans transporting old world pathogens and livestock across the Atlantic introduced new dangers to Native Americans, which contributed to a decline in their numbers that physical anthropologists have estimated amounted to 90% between 1492 and 1800. At the same time, the arrival first of Europeans and then of enslaved Africans contributed to wide-ranging wide changes in the ways that human communities use resources. There were many visible manifestations of these changes across American landscapes, including the spread of European-style farming and plantation-style agriculture. But today I want to consider the history of American landscape in chronological context with a particular focus on the 16th century. What I have to say is keyed by four sets of images, a series of 14th century paintings on wooden boards in a church in Fréjus in the south of France, an atlas created in 1547, now in the possession, possession of the Huntington Library in San Marino, a late 16th century illustrated manuscript natural history of the West Indies, now at the Morgan in New York, and some well-known images uh, from the Outer Banks of Carolina, also from the late 16th century. These images bring us into contact with three crucial stages of early modern environmental history. A chance to consider observations of the natural world that we now dismiss as superstition or nonsense. A chance to witness an early effort to record the emerging environment of the basin, especially on this side of the Atlantic Ocean. And a chance to examine what I call the landscape of history. So let me begin with Fréjus. Has anyone ever been to this place, by the way? Oh, I'm very happy to know that because most people go either to Caen or Saint-Tropez, which are on either side of it, and skip over Fréjus. Fréjus is a town that began to take shape when Romans colonized the south of France. By the central Middle Ages, it was a market town with the cathedral here rising as its most prominent building. In back here, you can't see it from this picture, there was a cloister, there is a cloister. From 1353 to 1368, artists painted 1,235 wooden panels that can now be seen in the cloister. They're about this big or so. Uh, these are painted in the years just following uh, the spread of the plague across the region. Many of the images have faded across the centuries, but some of them are quite clear and unsurprising, the kinds of things you would likely see in a church including images, as you see here, of tonsured monks on the left, and other images with some fairly obvious Christian symbolism, like this lamb carrying a cross. But a lot of the images, I think perhaps now a majority of the surviving images perhaps, uh, depict monsters, monstrous creatures, a sort of who's what of the monstrous races that Europeans since the time of Pliny believed lived somewhere out there, somewhere beyond the borders of Christendom. The images, and you can see some of them here, the images include hybrids of various sorts, blemies, that is people with heads on their chests, dog-faced humans, and some, like this one on the right, that simply defy characterization. If anyone wants, there are a lot of scientists here, if someone wants to name that creature, I'll be happy to follow your lead. What's amazing about these pet pictures at, at, at Fréjus is that they're side by side with images of more uh, quotidian things like people fishing and hunting. So the question then becomes, where did such images come from? Well, we know the specific source because there was a rich tradition of, rich tradition of illustrations about monstrous races that have been kept alive in manuscript encyclopedias and bestiaries for hundreds of years. 
Eventually, these ideas of the monstrous races would find their most famous representation in the Nuremberg Chronicle of 1493, a book that appeared at about the same time that Europeans began to learn of Columbus's voyages. Europeans believed that these monstrous entities were real, not imaginary fictions. Columbus was actually one of the believers. In two places in his first account of the West Indies, he says, I expected to see monsters, but I found none. But even though Columbus said that, when his accounts started to circulate, one illustrated version of it, uh, this is a version of Columbus, still depicted the monsters. They had to be real. Perhaps Columbus just missed them. <laughs> the painters of Frejus were not alone in depicting the monstrous in their work. Scientists and cartographers did so as well. This is a two-page spread from Sebastian Munzer's work of cosmography from the mid-16th century. These views depict a cultural, if not a physical, reality. There were monsters everywhere in the early modern Atlantic world. Time and again, we find them staring out from the page, invading our imaginations, and making us wonder why people a half a millennium ago thought so much about them. We tend to think of landscapes as visible, but these images suggest that we need to remember that other peoples understood that there were porous boundaries between the world we saw every day and the world that they knew existed, but perhaps was unseen, a world populated by monsters. Columbus's voyages initiated changes in the way that human communities formed and changed after 1492. His and other Europeans' travels also began to change ideas about landscapes, and not just by proving that monstrous races didn't exist. We can get a sense of the changes of, we can get a sense of how, of these changes in progress by looking at two manuscripts. The first is, is known at today as the Vallard Atlas. It's in the collection of the Huntington, and it was owned by a man named Nicholas Vallard of Dieppe. We know nothing, virtually nothing about him. The atlas that now bears his name, and by the way, if you're, if you're used to a Mercator projection of the world, you need to flip it around, because in this map, south is to the top and north is to the bottom. It's a reminder of how geographic knowledge changes over time. Anyway. This atlas consists of 15 separate two-page two maps uh, attached to four pages for how to read compasses at particular latitudes. It came together in Dieppe, uh, the port that was the home of many cartographers who benefited from the patronage, patronage of King Francis I. The cartographers working in Dieppe embraced news of Atlantic discoveries, which they quickly translated into visual form, including in this atlas. The, the maps here come from the hands of one or two people who had probably seen Portuguese accounts of the world and who had read a lot of travel narratives. And by reading those narratives, they put things in the interior of the maps that, that they essentially made up from their imagination. So I want to take a careful look at two of the maps in the Vallard to give you a sense of how this works. The first is a map of what is now Eastern Canada. If you look at this map, and you were interested in it, as many Europeans were in the 16th century, in the fur trade, this picture was perfect. Many Europeans understood that the old world supply of fur-bearing animals were disappearing, and here was a map of a new place. I'm gonna, I hope I get this right with the clicker. Oh, I didn't, okay. Here's a place where there are fur-clad native peoples and fur-bearing animals. That is, there was an idea that if Europeans could get to Canada, there would be a way to advance their own economic benefit. But I think the more revealing map is a map of, East, of Eastern South America. And I want to draw our attention to two different places on this map. The first, here's a whole, this is what the whole page looks like. And the first is the southern part of that map, where we see a depiction in what we would think of as southern Chile or even Antarctica, of naked giants, the Patagonian giants, which the artists created from their reading of, of Magellan and others' accounts about what they saw when they were there. A fantastic image that strikes us as implausible. On the same page, farther north, we see this tableau in modern day uh, Brazil. The center of the action here focuses on a well-dressed European man bearing the objects of European civilization, such as a mirror and metal tools, or they're dragging them behind him. Okay. 
and offering them, to, offering them to a group of Tupanambans. The nudity of the natives, which had been a feature of the reports of earlier European travelers, revealed them to Europeans as primitive. But the feather headdress, and I'm giving you this example here from one at the National Museum of Copenhagen, really tempted Europeans who had become fascinated with American feathers and the featherwork of Americans. In addition to that scene of trade that's going on sort of at the bottom of that detail there, we see something else going on in this picture. And that's the scene right here at the top right uh, as you look at it. This is a picture of Tupanamans harvesting Brazil wood trees, which Europeans wanted uh, so they could extract dye to color clothing. The image suggests how the landscape of the Americas had already begun to change with the extraction of animals and trees, a physical world now animated, uh, as Europeans would have thought of it, by the arrival of market-oriented market -oriented European Christians. The future wasn't here quite yet. There's no depiction of European settlements in this picture, but one could form a mental image of mental image of how they would emerge through the harvesting of American resources, quite possibly, and we know quite tragically, with the labor of Americans themselves. The other manuscript that gives us this sort of view of this landscape evolving is the Histoire Naturelle des Indes, which is often known as the Drake Manuscript in the collection of the Morgan. Like the Vallard, this is also in an unknown hand. The creators of the Histoire Naturelle concentrated their efforts, much of their effort, on illustrating unique flora, the flora of the West Indies. A wise choice since 16th century Europeans were always eager to find new plants to satisfy their medicinal and their gastric demands. The manuscript contains pictures of one plant after another. West Indian garlic, a cocoa plum, avocado, berries, pineapples, gourds, tomatoes, sweet potatoes, coconuts, plantains, watermelon, cactus, figs, each with a caption. One plant appeared more than once, tobacco. The first image, the one on the left, describes the plant. The fact of this depiction would not come as a surprise since Europeans had been fascinated by tobacco and its alleged properties since exploring travel with, traveling with Columbus had described it in the late 15th centuries. Europeans believed that tobacco was the great wonder drug of their era. It could, be, it could cure all ailments and there was one medical tract after another which scribed, described the great benefits of it. The, the text in the Drake tells how the natives used tobacco for food as well as an extremely benefit, beneficial medicine, as the text puts it. When they are sick, they breathe and smoke by mouth. Soon the ill humor escapes by vomiting. But I think more interesting, <laughs> more interesting, I think, actually, is the other picture of tobacco, which appears in this book. Here we can see quite clearly a victim, of, a victim who is bleeding there, lying on a hammock, and someone else burning tobacco leaves underneath, and then the tobacco smoke going up in a tube, and the tobacco smoke would heal, uh, would heal the wound. As the manuscript tells us, when the Indians are mortally wounded by arrows, one lays them on a rack and makes an oven with a tube leading to the wound of the sick man. When the fire is lighted, they put in it a leaf of tobacco together with a resin called balsam, and as soon as the smoke enters the wound, the patient, wound of the patient, they take a leaf of tobacco with some of the balsam and make a plaster which they apply to the wound, and he is cured. The depiction, the image conveys a very specific message. Those who cultivated tobaccos could share the secrets about its, med about its medicinal benefits. This was very important to Europeans in the 16th century who had often seen native people smoking tobacco in pagan rituals and were afraid that the consumption of tobacco might actually lead to the uh, disappearance of their civilization. What images like this showed was that there were ways to extract the good parts of the plant and leave the dangerous parts behind. The Soir Naturel also contained a series of pictures of people using the lands that they have here. So just briefly, I'm just going to tell you, this is gold flowing down a creek uh, after a storm, people fishing, by, but, but putting strings over their ears as the lines go in the water so they could feel a tug and pull it up initially quickly, 
pearl diving with claims that the natives could stay underwater for 15 minutes, and the deeper they went, the larger the pearls, catching parrots through this inventive thing, which they would do by having, by catching one parrot, put it in the tree, it would squawk, other parrots would come, and then they would catch them as well, and then using fences and fire to contain, to grab, to catch conies, to catch rabbits, essentially. They had mastered, that is, this environment. And these wonders of American nature wouldn't have come as a surprise to Europeans who by this time, this is the late 16th century, who by this time had read stories that Native Americans went through the forest at night guided by fireflies and of a Mexican king who would, who would go across the water when he would summon manatees and ride on their back. That is, there was some expectation that this was a place of marvelous nature and Europeans could take advantage of it. But there was also a sense that this place was changing. And those changes are evident in two of the pictures from the Histoire Naturelle. One, a new species, uh, a, a cross between a European cow and an American deer. You're a scientist, you figure it out. Um, <laughs> And then second, the idea that these natives were consumed with pagan ideas, but European Christians would arrive, they would take them, they're just literally physically guiding them, they would bring them Christianity, and by doing so, they would vanquish the demons that Europeans believed, that, Europe, that Native Americans believed were in the forest. That is, Europeans would do more than profit financially from coming to the Americas, they would also spread Christianity. We gain our final sense of the relationship between landscape and history by looking at a book which is very well known to every early American historian by Thomas Harriot called The Brief and True Report of the Newfound Land of Virginia. This is a book, this is the 1590 engraving of the book, uh, which was done by a series of paintings done by an artist, a watercolorist named John White in 1585 in Roanoke. He traveled with Harriet, and then the engravings were done five years later uh, in, in Frankfurt. This 1590 edition, this is the title page of it, um, was published in four languages, English, German, frat, uh, English, French, German, and Latin. It consists, the book consists of five parts. A description of the natural world, an accounting of the commodities that could be extracted, an ethnography of the Carolina Algonquians, that is the people who live there, a series of illustrations of the Algonquians and their world, and then a series of images of the Picts, whom the authors identified as the legendary inhabitants of Britain. These images have been analyzed a lot, but really bear close examination. Most of White's pick paintings, which White's watercolors on the left, depict people against a blank background. When they're engraved, the engravers in Frankfurt invented whole scenes behind them that has created a landscape based on what they read and based on what they thought must have been there. So we have a picture here of a conjurer flyer who was really a healer. There were pictures of various scenes. This was a dance, a religious, a religious activity. Here, as in many of them, there are, there are signs of American nature, in this case, harvesting the vast aquatic resources uh, that existed in the waters. And you'll see in the, in the printed version, there are far more creatures than there actually were in the painted version. White and, and the engravers did two towns, a palisaded village called Pumioke, and then I think more important, an open air village called Sakota. And if you've read through the sequence of the book, a lot of these little scenes in here actually had been, been uh, close-ups in the book. As you read towards the end of the book, you get a picture of this man uh, who is tattooed, uh, and that becomes a, a sort of very important image as things move on. Neither De Bruyne nor White nor Harriet could have understood the significance that this book would have. But in the years that followed, series of images came. They followed that tattoo image by the images of the Picts, showing them as just as savage as ancient Britons. And then as the years went by, the images recycled again. The tattoos come in books about how to think about tattooing. Images from the book appear in a general history from 1624. They appear again in 1705 in Robert Beverly's history. And then, fairly remarkably in my mind, they appear in this work of 1841, now depicting a landscape that doesn't exist, a landscape of American aborigines, as they were called, who are now gone 
victims of the onward march of history. Landscapes changed over time in the Americas, reflecting different moments of conquest and colonization and different ways of survival. But though things changed, some things remained the same. And so I end with this picture of mosquitoes. In the frantic artist's, in the frantic artist's depiction of a swarm, a series of singular dots expressed pain and disorientation. This is, well, it was there, okay, you saw it. Anyway, <laughs> I was gonna say, that's just a reminder that some things never change. Thank you. Questions? Okay. Any questions out there? There's one. Go ahead. Yeah. Never had the Peter, um, Richard Kagan from Johns oh. Hopkins. Hey, Richard. Sugar, which is the first major European export, or agricultural export that would change forever the, the landscape of the Caribbean. The, the Drake manuscripts doesn't really focus on any of these changing the, the European imports as opposed to the indigenous landscapes. Is that correct? The manuscripts that I'm using, yes, but, but, but a lot of the 17th century landscapes focus very much on how the spread of sugar plantations changed the land. So we have a lot of those. But for the 16th century, there's much less of that, of the depictions of that, at least in these manuscripts. Thank you. Uh, Michael Silverstein from Chicago. Um, I, I, I'm wondering about the circulation of these materials, especially in the earlier period. Um, the, these, it, it's not like printing today, uh, needless to say, um, uh, where people could easily purchase these kinds of things um, as commodities. Uh, so I'm, I'm really wondering about um, uh, the audience uh, and uh, the readership and what the effect of the particularities of who got to see these things um, was. Okay, so that's a great question. So I'm going to so I'm going to deal with each of these sets of images very briefly. So the paintings in Frejus, if you go to Frejus now and you take a tour, um, the tour guide will tell you, however improbable this is going to sound, the tour guide would tell you that as people went to Mass on Sunday, they first would go through the cloister where the priests would allegedly point up and say, if you don't pay attention, you know, to the lessons here, this is what awaits you in hell, right? <laughs> So that audience would be churchgoers, right? Those are situated in place. The manuscripts, the Vallard manuscript is a, very, is a very fine piece of art, which obviously had a royal clientele, right? That did not circulate anywhere as far as we know. The Drake was probably done, I um, mean, yeah, the Drake manuscript was probably done with people. It's a very small book. I don't know how many of you have seen it. It's physically small. And how far those ideas went, it's hard to know because some of the plants that they're depicted in there had already been depicted in European plants. But there's also, there's at this period of the latter decades of the 16th century, there's this fluorescence of European herbals which are popping up and some of the same images. So did these paintings get, illustrate the herbals? Hard to know. The white and debris images is I think our clearest example of someone who goes over, white goes over in 1585, paints these scenes you know, on the spot, brings them back through a network of people who are trying to promote Protestant colonization in North America. They make it to the Debray workshop. It's the first book that simultaneously appears in four languages with these illustrations and tells this very significant tale. And then from that point on, from the publication of 1590, the images are reused and reused and reused. In fact, I often make a joke. I think it is a matter of law in America that anyone who does an American history textbook must use some of these images because they are in every textbook that appears. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Is there a question up there? Werner Gundersheimer, Sarasota. Uh, your closing remark with the evanescent mosquitoes and the observation that some things never change got me thinking about the third book of Rabelais' Gargantua and Pantagruel, in which uh, Rabelais, who was a physician, writes about the search in the New World for a plant called hemp which had many uh, magical and restorative properties and many, many other uses. 
that, of course, was the 16th century analog of what is today known as the cannabis plant. Some things never change. <laughs> <laughs> I leave you with that word, exactly. <laughs> Any more questions? There's one there. Erwin Shapiro, Cambridge, Mass. Yeah. Early on, when you were showing pictures of monsters, you know, imaginary monsters, you also showed pictures of dwarfs. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering what role they played. Were they considered monsters, or was there some other role they played at, at that time? That is an excellent question. So what I can tell you most about that is, um, and this has actually been depicted in film as well, so it's not, you don't have to go back to the 16th century sources, but when Europeans came to the Americas and they saw people of very short stature, they often made a point of them and they often linked these people with having sort of healing powers, right? That they sort of had special things. So within indigenous communities, these people were not necessarily looked at as monstrous, but in the European construction of the other, of these monstrous races that must be out there, they were looped with people who had giant ears, people with heads on their chests. And you know, one of my personal favorites, a guy, and he was depicted in the Nuremberg Chronicle, who just had one giant foot, and who laid on his back and used the giant foot to shield himself from the sun. So I don't think there was any specific, if there's a lot about specific people, short stature in the Americas, I don't know that literature other than these casual observations. Okay. I think we have a question back here. Yeah. Um, I actually, I just make a comment, Peter, about that, the one foot. I mean, uh, I, he, that same illustration appears in some uh, manuscripts of um, uh, Marco Polo. So right. that right. The, the, the idea of those monsters goes to China as well as the Americas um, in the European literature. But I have a different kind of a question, and my question has to do with not the John White images in Debray, but the Jacques Lemoyne images, because they're not in the Thomas Harriet book Correct. that you were talking about. So um, for other people, the uh, Jacques Lemoyne was a, another European artist who went to America in, this, in the late 16th century and was with the French colony that did not survive in what's now South Carolina. And I, my question has to do with, did those images circulate as widely as the, as the images from Harriet? I assume not, but I wonder, are they only available in the large Debray compilations or are they also separated, uh, in, circulated separately? Well, I think originally all of the, the Lemoyne were only available in the Debray, but the one image that does reappear is the one where the Europeans had left a pedestal behind and it had been integrated into native culture and then it was later depicted again. That image reappears, but most of the others, they reappear, reappear in the 20th century, but they don't seem to be common in the early modern period. And, and Mary Beth, to your first point, a lot of those monsters that Europeans believe, they're all existing somewhere out in the East, and then there's just this belief that they must be in the Americas as well. Yeah. We have a final question in the back. Hi, uh, Jan Zulkowski, uh, currently in Washington. Uh, two quick observations. One is that the creature that's attracted so much attention and a couple of comments now is the uh, skyopod or the, the, the shadow foot uh, which, which had a um, large foot that would sh uh, protect it from the, the sun. And I think one reason why those attracted so much attention with relation to the Americas was the squirrel which is uh, one of the, f uh, a word in English that comes from Greek meaning shadow tail. I, I think that they thought perhaps that the long puffy tail of the squirrel was to protect it from the sun. Uh, the last, since I'm coming last, uh, the second observation is just a uh, trivial suggestion. You asked for a name for the monstrous creature that you showed. I would suggest Fleur de Lizard. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, think that's, I think that's a perfect ending. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Thank you.